Tonight on Dispatches, we hear the true voices of Britain's Muslims. We live in difficult times um, and people are living in fear. We reveal how Muslim integration in Britain has come to a standstill. I only hear what Allah and his messenger say. Can't you get that through your thick skull? This film is about one of the most difficult and controversial questions facing this country. To what extent do British Muslims represent a threat to this country and its values? The fear is that some British Muslims reject the liberal, secular, tolerant ways that characterize Britain and instead want a Britain that bends to the wishes of Islam. And there's a real anxiety that a small but dangerous group of young men actively support the 7-7 bombings. Are these fears realistic? We do know that some British Muslims have uncompromising opinions. In Islam, any person who commits adultery will be stoned to death. But how representative are they? Channel 4 has conducted the most comprehensive and rigorous survey to date of Muslim opinion in Britain. We talked to over a thousand Muslims, not just angry young men, but the elderly, women, the poor and wealthy businessmen. For the first time, these results accurately represent the diversity of views in the community. Do I feel British? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, born and brought up in this country, of course I do. What we've discovered is important and should fundamentally change our understanding of British Muslims. It will also help shape the debate in how we tackle the threat of extremism. Because what our survey shows is that, in effect, integration has come to an end. Young British Muslims are less liberal, more religious than their parents, and many are determined not just to be different, but to be separate from the rest of the nation. To get to grips with the results of the survey, I'm on a journey through the country to understand what Muslims want. First stop, Stoke-on-Trent. The proportion of Muslims here, 3%, reflects exactly that of the whole country. There are no ghettos, so is it a place where Muslims and non-Muslims live similar lives. It is Sunday, and just as in any other town in the country, a group of young men are playing football. Azad and his friends were all born in Britain, but that doesn't mean that they feel comfortable with everything that is British. If you ask any Muslim, you know, we, I've got no problem with anyone sitting in McDonald's eating a bacon and egg butty, because that's none of my business. Yeah. What well, my business, what I'm concerned with is the foreign policy of this country and every other European country. I don't like no terrorists and all that. I just want, live, I just want everyone to live happily in that. When a roadside bomb goes off in Iraq and 24 people, you know, die, it's the same as when 54 people die in, 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 on the 7th of July. But where's the, where's the silences and the, and the remembrances for the Muslims? When the talk turns to the events of 9-11, their comments reveal views out of step with wider public opinion. They simply don't believe 9-11 was the work of Islamic terrorists. I, I, think. I think it was all set up, if you ask It was all set up to... It was all, it was all government. For all we know, Bush and Bin Laden could be sitting in one room together right now and sipping champagne. Who's to blame for 9-11? Is it Bin Laden or is it Bush? Or is it both of them? Yeah, you, I, why I, I, why I, I can't they get Bin Laden? Because if they get Bin Laden, it's game over. They'll have to leave the Middle East. And they don't want to leave the Middle East, so that's the reason they've put there. They also think that Princess Diana was killed because of her relationship with a Muslim. Why haven't they got to the bottom of Princess Diana's death till yet? You can, you, you can see what happened there. Do you know, do you know, what, you know, do you know what I think what happened on Prince Diana's death? I think, right, Inside that, job? I think, right, that because they thought that Diana would get married to that guy, Muslim, that Muslim guy, and if he would have had a kid and then, I don't know, someday he would have been king or something. The surprising thing is not that some Muslims choose to believe conspiracy theories, but that these views are so widely held. In our representative survey, four out of ten think Diana was killed to stop her marrying a Muslim, and half believe 9-11 was a conspiracy by the USA and Israel. It seems many British Muslims believe the establishment is conspiring against them. This is not a community at ease with the country they live in. Assad and his friends, part of the more than one and a half million strong Muslim community now living in Britain. 
Most have families who came from the Indian subcontinent in the 1960s or 70s, or from Africa more recently. The big assumption was that, like other migrants, they would settle here and integrate into British society. But our survey shows that this process of integration is quite different when it comes to Muslims. 90 miles north of Stoke lies Bradford, a city with a large Muslim population. Many Muslims here have settled like they have elsewhere in Britain in the poor, deprived part of the inner city where unemployment levels are high, educational achievement is low. In 2001, riots broke out as thousands of young men fought each other in the city's streets. The official report into those riots said that the main cause of the disturbances was the fact that Muslims and non-Muslims lived parallel and separate lives. These northern towns symbolize a kind of culture clash in which Muslims are seen in some way to be isolated, insular, separatist. The question is whether religious commitment is the force that separates Muslims from the rest of Britain, one of the most secular countries in the world. Certainly, our survey found that 93% said that religion was important to them. Elizabeth. Shireen Najarelli, a 45-year-old mother of two, has successfully made her home here. She teaches children the Quran from her front room every afternoon. So when you're reading it, it stays Alif Sabar A. Uh. All you have to say is A. Uh. OK? All right. Try it again. Good. Very good. Who hasn't read? Islam is central to Shireen's life. I do whatever has to be done, wherever you are in the world. You have to do these things if you are a Muslim. You will bring up your daughters to be... Like uh, me? Yeah. They'll wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and read the namaz and then go back to bed. They'll do that. They'll pray, they'll fast with me, you know, with, during Ramadan and uh, we'll, we'll read the Quran. No, this is it. Shireen doesn't wear her religion any more lightly at work. She has a full-time job at Bradford College and openly prays in her office. Do they see you here as very religious? Yes, I think they think I am religious. I pray, I read namaz, I read Quran, I fast, I give uh, charity. Well, yeah, they see me pray. I've got my prayer mat, I've got my scarf, I pray here. It would be easy to assume that living in secular Britain could be a real problem for Shireen. Not so. Uh, do you feel easy in Britain? I mean, do you feel easy in Bradford? Oh, yes. Yeah, I feel easy in Bradford. I, I've come here, I've lived here, I work and uh, I've integrated in the society. My friends have always been multi multicultural. I, I don't think, me, if I want to be more religious, I would put my friends away, even though my best friend is an English woman. I wouldn't put her away. She is my best friend, she is my best friend. She comes to my house, I, we go out together. So I think I have a place for these people and a place for my religion. And it turns out that the vast majority in our survey shared Shireen's attitude. Being in this country, we feel very British, but we also have to adapt to our religion because it's, it's a way of faith and religion is so important. It also gives you the identity of what you are as well. However, despite many feeling both British and Muslim, the survey revealed other views that were far less reassuring, particularly among those born and brought up here. The general assumption that as they grow up, second and third generations integrate more than their parents and elders did has to be re-examined. Our survey shows that many young Muslims are now identifying less with Britain and more with their religion than their parents and elders did. Gullam from Leighton is 19 and studies biomedicine at London University. He's been elected an official of the National Union of Students. Like many young Muslims in the survey, Gulam openly talks of his sense of separation from his country. Oh, we, but it just makes you like more angry with this country, more That's discontent right, and, and more you, disenfranchised, and you don't want to be like with them, because they're just against you, it's like us and them. I went to meet Gulam at his local cafe with another friend of his, Jamal. He too is a student of politics at Westminster University. They don't feel British at all, but the question is, how extreme are their views? Do you even regard yourself as British? Uh, in terms of the maybe uh, geographical sense, mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But in terms of where I, where I get any my values or ideas from, or motivation to do any action, no, I, I wouldn't t take it from any non-Islamic non source, i.e. 
Britain or any British values. So. What upsets you about Britain? I could never associate myself with another country which currently engages in you know, oppression against not only Muslims but anyone who doesn't uh, fit its interests. This is what is radicalizing Muslims. This is, he gave an example of himself, how he changed. My situation was pretty much exactly the same, yeah? The, uh, the Iraq war, yeah? This is what made me think, OK, why, why, why are they being attacked here? Yeah? What have they actually done? Many assume that potential radicals only come from the deprived areas of Britain. But the well-off and the well-educated are drawing away just as much. Gulum explained that it was the very fact of his education that's led him to think the way he does. When our generation, our parents and ancestors came, they came for the sole reason of making money. They weren't thinking about anything else. Now the kids, they can start thinking about all the other extra stuff, about educating yourself, about becoming a productive individual, an intelligent individual. And then once we're intelligent, all that, then we start taking a realization of what's happening in the world. And that's what our realization, that's why I become practicing. I would say I have a system yeah, or I, I uh, understand a system, Islam, which actually uh, could be equally as good, if not better, yeah, in terms of looking after the affairs of its citizens. Yeah? So on a state level or on an individual level, yeah, I believe that Islam is, uh, is superior. Gulam and Jamal want to convince the whole nation, including me, to become Muslim. You would like me to be a Muslim? <laughs> Ideally. You would? <laughs> ideally, I'd, I'd, I'd be... You would like me to be a Muslim? Of course, because ideally, ideally I, I view Islam has the solutions to all a man's problems. And for, for, for that solution to cater for the people and treat them right. Strange, really. I mean, language, words are so important. I, I wouldn't call them extremists, I'd call them separatists. They're absolutely convinced that Islam really has much better solutions than anything we've ever come up with. But extremists? No, separatists. But this sense of separatism could become a threat if it leads to sympathy for suicide bombings. In our representative survey, almost one in four said that the 7-7 bombings were justified in light of British support for the war on terror. And Muslims under the age of 24 were twice as likely to show this sympathy than those over 45. We also found that eight out of the 1,000 polled consistently chose the most radical and extreme answer to every question. That is my identity. Abu Muwahid is a 23-year-old graphic designer from East London. He wasn't one of these, but when I met him in a park near his house, he did not condemn terrorist attacks. You can tell me now what you think about 7-7. The reason why they carried out those attacks were, was because of the foreign policy of Britain in, in Iraq. So what was the cause? The foreign policy, how to solve it? You know, remove the foreign policy, remove the British troops from Iraq. It's very simple. Well, that one won't, that one won't two. bring more than 50 people back from the dead, will it? Neither will condemning it. Neither will making new laws. Uh, it doesn't make sense. If we want to stop the cycle of blood, what's happened is ha has happened. If we want to stop it, we must look to the cause. Because violence is not just absolutely forbidden in Islam. It depends who the violence is directed to. Uh, violence against a criminal, uh, in Islam, it's considered a, a praise duty, but violence against innocent people is forbidden. But those Muslims in the, in the World Trade Center, if you just want to isolate them, uh, they were not criminals. Well, again, we need to refer to the text. We need to see what they were doing in the World Trade Center and if, um, what, you know, even our job, our occupation in Islam must be based upon the text. I you you mean if they had offended against Islam, it would be quite justifiable to throw, throw a plane into You see, if a Muslim building. commits adultery, then he, he, he would be stoned to death. A Muslim. I'm talking about a Muslim here. So, in that, so any uh, so adulterers in the World Trade Center, in your book, uh, it's quite justified to kill them? No, they should not be killed in that way. There should be any, in Islam, any person who commits adultery will be stoned to death. Can you imagine yourself ever being driven to such uh, extremes that you would consider taking up arms for Islam? No, um, I, I would not. Uh, my, me personally, I would not strap bombs on my body and, and I would not call others to do so. But Islam orders me and obliges me to, to strive for my religion, to strive for Islamic way of life and to defend um, my sanctity and my property. But, I mean, Listening to our conversation was another local Muslim. He took exception to Abu's views and interrupted us. If you live in a land which is uh, Darul Kuf, land of non-Muslims, predominantly, you're advised, if you're going to live within it, you're, you have to respect and live by the law of the land. If you're going to get all the benefits, the free uh, education, the free medication, the free, uh, you know, the doll, for example, then, you know, you are, you are accepting handouts. 
you should go maybe to Egypt. That's exactly what I hear from the BNP. Well, hang on a minute. I mean, he's made a very strong point. You, you do not feel British. You don't accept British law, but you've accepted a free education at Islington College. <coughs> no, I do, no. This was before I was practicing Islam. After I practiced Islam, well, uh, that was I very convenient, truth, wasn't it? That's the way it was. Isn't so it? you that's, got that's, all that's your that's freebies, and then then you started that's practicing. Allah is the provider, not not man. Allah is the one who provides. Allah is the one who teaches us. Abu has found an increasing commitment to Islam. It reflects a tendency among young British Muslims to be more religious than their parents. This in marked contrast to the pattern followed by other groups such as Sikhs and Hindus. I'm on my way to see a professor to talk about what our survey tells us about the progress of the integration of the Muslim community. Twelve years ago, Tariq Madud conducted a major survey of all ethnic minorities in this country. Is there evidence in some way from this survey that the Muslim community is aberrant when you come to look at the broad swathe of immigrant communities that have come to Britain in the last 50 years? I think Muslims do stand out. Broadly speaking, as people settle, they become anglicised in this particular respect. That is to say, they wear their religion more lightly. But, but not for Muslims. Political identification with Islam has definitely grown and has grown more amongst young people and has grown more amongst educated people. Comparing our survey with the one 12 years ago, it seems the process of integration for Muslims has come to a standstill. Islam is providing a powerful alternative path for young Muslims born here, a quite different direction to the one being taken by this country. By whatever measure you judge it, Britain is becoming a more liberal society. We drink more than any other country in Europe. Sex outside marriage is the norm. The law sanctions equal rights for women and for homosexuals. In part two, we'll see where the morals of British Muslims come into conflict with the rest of the nation. And we'll be asking whether those differences are driving Muslims and non-Muslims further apart. Do British Muslims have different values from the rest of the nation? Many British Muslims define themselves by their religion and are openly critical of the liberal morality that they see around them. But whilst British values and Muslim values may be different, are they really incompatible? Nothing symbolizes the difference more than the veil. To some, it's a clear indication of the oppression of Muslim women. To compare the opinions of Muslims with those of Britain as a whole, we conducted a second survey of over a thousand Britons, and we discovered that over half the British population think Muslim women are treated as second-class citizens. Rukia is a 24-year-old health worker in a hospital outside Manchester. When she was 21, she decided to wear the veil or niqab. It's a sign of her commitment to Islam. What do you say to those people who might think that the veil was a symbol somehow of oppression, that in fact you're denied liberation. I mean, stereotypes do come from reality as well. However, that is not the teaching of Islam. A lot of people have asked me in the past, did your parents force you? Are you married? Does your husband make you wear the niqab? Um, none of which applies to me. It was a decision that I came to from my own desire to find out what it is to be a Muslim woman. But Rukia is aware that wearing the veil does make her stand out. But we live in a society here in which identity is paramount because of fear of uh, terror. Do you feel easy wearing the veil in a society which is essentially unveiled? Where I have suffered from verbal abuse, which is very Islamophobic, I have had fleeting thoughts. Well, because I am living in a society where this isn't the norm, that is why this is happening. But it seems that you're setting a, an extra hurdle which actually makes it difficult for people to communicate with you. Are you finding it difficult to speak with me? It's not that I'm scared or wary of who you are, it's that I actually long to see your face. Mm -hmm. But that is the purpose of the veil, that you shouldn't, which is why, which is why I wear it. But I won't visit any harm on you if I, if I see your face. What's the, what, it's you, perhaps, scared of me. No, um, that's, that's not how 
how I think or why women are prescribed to cover. You walked here, you said, well, I burnt off some calories. <laughs> um, I thought it was interesting that beneath the veil, there's still the same concern that most people have. <laughs> I'm a normal average girl with the same sorts of concerns and issues that everybody would about their waistline. <laughs> Well, I've never interviewed anybody through a veil before. I'd rather, in a way, she didn't wear it, because obviously, when you communicate with somebody, it's a full facial thing, lips, cheeks, expression. But I wouldn't say she's oppressed. In fact, covering the head, whether fully, as in the veil, or partially, as with the hijab, turns out not to be as indicative of oppression as commonly supposed. As far as most Muslims are concerned, it's for the woman to decide. You can't force anyone to wear hijab. Um, that's not promoted by Islam. Um, all Islam does is um, encourage and um, it's out of your own free will. And two out of three women said they did not feel they were treated as second-class citizens. Those who grew up in this country felt even less oppressed. Muslim attitudes towards equality between men and women are moving in the direction of mainstream Britain. But when it comes to sex between men and women, conservative attitudes are the order of the day. More than three quarters of Muslims in Britain regard sex outside marriage as never acceptable, whilst the same proportion of Britons regard it as absolutely normal. This attitude to sex was just as common amongst the young as the old. Growing up in this liberal society has not made all young Muslims liberal. Hina is a media studies student in East London. She and her friends are 19 years old, but it's marriage, not moving in with boyfriends, that they talk about. When you get married, I don't know, stop asking me that question. Because why is everybody always asking me every day? Because you're the most. Uh, this is just cool. You're the oldest. Yeah. Well, I'm the oldest, you're the oldest. We're, we're career women, that's why. We've got careers. Yeah, we have careers. When it comes to marriage, the perception that young Muslims are forced to marry against their will is not the case. Nine out of ten said that they should choose their own partners. I went to meet Hina at home where she lives with her mother and father to ask whether her Muslim upbringing created a barrier with her non-Muslim friends. Hello. Hi, Hina, I'm John. Hi, John, how are nice you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. The fact that your belief leads you not to smoke, not, not to drink, in fact, not, not to have boyfriends, the rest do you feel it separates you from... A very big part of the community? Yeah, I mean, nowadays, it's socially, you need to have a boyfriend and you need to smoke and you need to, you know, drink and you need to do a, a whole load to fit in into a social group. But I don't do them and I still feel as though I can still, like, have many different friends and achieve what I really want to achieve in life. And Asking Hina about what she watches on television reveals one strongly held conservative opinion. Do you watch Big Brother? Yeah. Always? Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. And what do you think of the people on this one? Oh, I don't know. Chabelle's like, oh, I've got a... You know, he's gay. And that's something, obviously, that's not in my religion or nothing. You see, that that's a big problem, isn't it? Because they say one in ten people are, are gay in British society. I mean, what do you say to them? I, th I personally think like they're just lost cause, aren't they? There's, there's something that's not normal with them because you know, God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. You can't really go... I mean, man and female elope to continue humanity. I mean, I have a lot of gay friends, yeah. But gay is wrong. You, you sh you, I would not encourage gay, people being gay, no. It's amazing, really, because uh, Hina kind of sums up everything so integrated and yet at the same time so separate. Um, you have this sense of somebody who's completely at peace with the iPod, the internet, um, plugs into friends at university and all the rest of it, but I mean, can't abide the thought of, of, of gays. Completely integrated on the one hand and really very separate on the other. At a time when gay partnerships have been legally recognised in Britain, over half of all Muslims think homosexuals should be banned from teaching in schools. Such views are only held by a quarter of the general population. This conservatism sees many Muslims deeply critical of British values. 
way. They always have to be beautiful. They always have to be thin. They always have to. They always have to impress other men on the street. And it's like, it's. I feel sorry for them sometimes to tell you the truth. Okay, I understand if a woman does want to show off her beauty to the whole world. That's different. But it's like it seems to me like they we're labelled as oppressed, but it seems to me like they're oppressed. And as far as drinking is concerned, growing up in Britain has made Muslims aged between 18 and 24 take an even harder line against alcohol than their elders. For many Muslims, the criticisms go even further than these specific issues. Four out of ten say that they are offended by Britain's bad moral behaviour. This view is leading many Muslim families to change the way they're bringing up their children. Uzma and her husband Harun Asif have three sons and live in Enfield. Uzma was born in Britain, she was brought up with British values, but Uzma's decided to reject the way she was raised. In fact, you've made a very interesting life journey, really, from quite a, a secular start. My father was uh, very modern. He, was, uh, he came to this country in the 1940s, and um, I think he thought he was just a white British person himself. You know, he wore the Harris Tweed coat and the hat, and I think, you know, you grow up and you're just shown that this is the way people live, this is the best way, and there's no alternative. And I was very much sucked into that as well. So I integrated fully. It's only when I thought, well, no, actually, they have a lot of social problems. There are lots of complexities that we don't hear about. Harun came over from Pakistan eight years ago and shares Asma's views. Were you shocked by what you found here from a moral point of view? Uh, yeah, certain things uh, really uh, shocked me, really, the way people use uh, alcohol and you know, the women uh, dress and you know the, how women are treated here, really. Um, uh, I found that women were used more as a product to sell the products. They were like a business commodity here. Uzma and Harun, in common with two-thirds of Muslims we questioned, think British parents allow their children too much freedom. They keep their families separate from the aspects of British culture they disapprove of, only exposing them to what they see as positive influences. Today, they're at the Natural History Museum. I know, isn't it big? What is it? It's a dinosaur. See, look, because they log all the forest, that's one of the factors why rhinos are becoming extinct. Because obviously, if they take away their habitat, how can they survive? Boys do go to a weekend school, so they supplement their sort of Islamic education on the weekends. It's like a, a very big part of my life because, like, on Saturdays and Sundays, um, I go to Islamic school, and then like during the day, um, we have to pray anyway. So it's like you just don't get out of your mind, so it's just imprinted there. They find it hard though. They do find it hard. We all find it hard getting up on a Saturday morning and going to the mosque. You know, they'd rather be out playing. When they go to school, they're going to learn a different way of life. And my role is to say, look, you know, this is my way of life. This is how I would like you to live your life. And I think it's um, while you're under my roof, you will live it that way. <laughs> Keeping their children separate from certain aspects of British culture has meant that almost half of Muslim parents in Britain today say they would rather send their children to an Islamic school. We were able to compare our findings with those of the last major survey in this area to get a real sense of what's happened to Muslim integration over the past 12 years. Is the Muslim community more alienated than when you looked in 1994? In the survey that we did in 1994, 24% of people said that they would send uh, an 11-year-old child to a state-funded Muslim school. Now you find that it's 44% who say that, so that's definitely uh, a growth towards a kind of more distinct Muslim community uh, identity or practice. One in three Muslims disapprove of the freedoms allowed in this country and would rather live under Sharia law. That is the law as laid down by the Quran. And the same number dream that one day Britain will become an Islamic state. I went to Peckham in South London to meet 29-year-old Hakan Han, a Turkish Cypriot in origin who believes that life under Sharia law would be better. Religious courts and rule by imams would, he believes, be far more effective than the current system. I feel that democracy altogether isn't working as a, as a system. 
I believe that um, man-made laws really isn't the answer. Why not go back to ruling from the church and ruling the land from the way how God says how you should rule it? Hakan particularly approves of Sharia law's range of harsh physical punishments for crimes, which would apply equally to children as adults. There's a lot of punishments in Sharia law, and the way I see those punishments is like a deterrent. Same way as how Western worlds have they use their nuclear weapons as a deterrent. Kids under 16, they're not eligible for punishment as, say, a full grown-up is. And they ought to be. I think everybody should be taken, um, you know, be given a certain punishment for their actions, if it, especially if it's really bad. To live under Sharia law is still only something a minority of Muslims desire. In fact, what Muslims want varies a good deal reflecting the diversity of opinion that exists within the community. For the most part, Muslim Britain does not speak with one voice. However, on a small number of issues, there is an important consensus of opinion, a consensus that is in direct conflict with the rest of the nation. In part three, we shall see where the flashpoints lie. Muslim Britain wants many different things, but there are some issues on which there is a striking consensus. Conflict will be the result when this consensus is opposed to the values of British democracy. And for a tiny number of radicals, these are conflicts to be settled through violent action. Finding a way to deal with these issues, therefore, is vital. If British society, if British politicians can't do deals with Muslims where there's a strong Muslim consensus, then we really do have a problem, because then moderate Muslims will be thrown back onto the radicals' agenda. One of the fundamental values that Britain holds dear is freedom of speech. But it's a value which Muslim Britain rejects. An overwhelming number of British Muslims believe that free speech must have its limits, that no one should be allowed to insult their religion. These tensions came to a head when the Danish cartoons depicting the Prophet Muhammad with a bomb on his turban were circulated all over the world. They have come together to insult the message of Muhammad In London, extreme protests followed, showing both the fury of some Muslims and the severity of the punishments they appeared to demand. Although only held by a very small minority, it is these views that seem to pose the greatest threat to the tolerance that so defines this country. To understand why some Muslims take such an uncompromising position, I talked to Mohammed, a 23-year-old British-born Muslim. He lives in North London with his family, but wanted to meet me in a coffee shop. Mohammed studied at art college and now works as a freelance graphic designer. How do you feel about the, uh, you know, those cartoons um, that uh, abused the name of the? Profit. If people have cartoons insult the messengers, it affects globally the Muslims worldwide. Not 1.5 Muslims in the UK, 1.5 billion Muslims around the world. I mean, they were not published in this country. Where was the condemnation? Where was the uh, demand that, they, that these, these kind of cartoons, cartoons be stopped and that the people be punished? Beheading the people who did it. Yeah. Is that what should have happened? Now, in Islam, there is punishment for certain crimes. Like, for example, if somebody is murdered, uh, the, we do have, have punishment in Islam, death penalty. Or if somebody's raped, we believe in death penalty for them. The same thing, anybody who insults the messengers, any messenger, Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, we believe they have tested their sentence. The offence caused by the Danish cartoons also led many more moderate Muslims to protest. They did not call for such extreme punishments, but they still wanted to stop the publication of anything that offended their religion. At any time. Insults. People who publish the cartoon of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, should be punished to a certain extent because that was so hurtful and it was so offensive. And you know what? You should, everyone should be like sensitive towards other people's faith. In Brixton, I met 29-year-old Abdul Haq, born a Christian, converted to Islam at 17. He's one of the many who believe there's no room for compromise on freedom of speech. A new law is the best way to ensure no one offends his religion. 
uh, from a non-Muslim perspective, we say free speech, you can basically say whatever you like. What's wrong with that? The problem with that is, is that where are the kind of boundaries or the limitations to that? That is the problem. What are the boundaries and limitations for you? Um, for me, it would be kind of those things which maybe some people might hold as uh, sacred. But do you think these, we should these, have laws kind of to ways. state that? It would be preferable, because otherwise, um, if there weren't le these kind of legislations in place, then you, people are obviously going to get very um, irate. Uh, there are common grounds with regards to respect, respecting each other. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, I wouldn't kind of disrespect any of your relatives or your, you know, your family members or your mother. So how do you stop people coming out onto the streets with placards saying, you know, behead, behead these people who abuse the, the, the name and image of the Prophet? Even though we find that repulsive, um, behead those who insult Islam, at the same time, it's you know, equally repulsive. I mean, that which you know, sparked off in the first place, it was equally you know, repulsive, if not even more so. It's really very clear that we have no centre ground on this issue. There are things that Muslims want protected as sacred and unassailable. And on the other hand, this is a secular society in which religious sensitivities are hardly an issue. So either we self-censor or we publish and we create mayhem. Further conflict may be unavoidable as Muslims are united in wishing to curb the right to speak freely. But an even greater conflict is already taking place over the way the war on terror is being fought at home. The search for homegrown terrorists following the 7-7 bombings has become a major objective for the police and security services. But at the same time, the majority of the British Muslim population feels under attack. I have been discriminated um, in this country because I wear this scarf. Yeah, because I carry this identity, I have been discriminated in this country. And it's not by any ordinary people in the country, it's by police as well. Yeah, P police that are, you know, um, in control from the government. And four out of ten of all Muslims surveyed say the police stop and search too many Muslims. The danger is, with Muslims increasingly opposed to the actions of the police, the task of finding terrorists could be seriously undermined. Events such as the flawed raid on a Muslim home in Forest Gate make matters still worse. This is the first time I've been on a demonstration like this. I really, really feel strongly about it, so that's why I come out. I brought my children along so they learn when something is not um, right that they come out and protest. It's clear that police actions are alienating the Muslim community, but the police need Muslims to be on their side to gather better intelligence. At the moment, Muslims are still on side. Eight out of ten that we questioned said that someone who knew of a terrorist act and did not report it would be to blame. And half believe as much as the terrorists themselves. But if this number drops, it will become even harder for the police to stop further attacks. Abu Mumin lives in Forest Gate and works at a Muslim youth centre. He was the one who interrupted my conversation with the young man who wouldn't condemn the 7-7 bombings and told him that Muslims should live according to the laws of this country. But he feels strongly that the government is making it increasingly hard for Muslims to help in the fight against terrorism. And I think Tony Blair, you know, he single-handedly managed to uh, create this unnecessary tension by saying the Muslim community is not cooperating, is not working hard enough. I mean, are we like sitting in our backside doing nothing? No, no, We're working no, hard, aren't we? Yeah, of course. No one acknowledges that, not even the media, um, community leaders. I don't know. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of positive work, isn't it? But it's not been acknowledged in, in many ways. I went to meet Abu at the youth centre after work to ask him about how British anti-terror laws are working on the ground. Can I just ask what effect the whole Forest Gate raid has had on the community? The, the whole community uh, are angry with the police. I think the young, the old. Uh, I think it's very important that um, the young especially begin to see that there is due process. We need to feel that we can trust the police again because uh, that was a very big blunder. I live in Forest Gate, it's in my backyard. It could have been me shot uh, by the police 
200 police officers uh, coming, in, uh, coming in and to arrest two people. But Abu was clear that terrorism does have to be tackled and that the community needs to get behind the police. There will be many in the community who never had much faith in the police to begin with. Why does it now matter so much if whatever the confidence they did have evaporates? If there are criminals in our community, then they need to be flushed out. Mm. They need to be uh, dealt with. We live in difficult times um, and people are living in fear. And what the politicians mustn't do, the police mustn't do, is add fuel to the fire. Muslims are taking to the streets on everything from freedom of speech to the war on terror. The fear is that if Muslims think no one is listening to them, the point will come where some will feel protesting is no longer enough. But our survey shows that a vast majority of Muslims already say that no one body speaks on their behalf. I think everyone should speak out. When every Muslim should speak out when they've got something to say. At the moment, there isn't anyone really there to represent us, and that's what we need. I went to Bolton to meet two brothers, Zulfi Bukhari, a marketing manager, and his brother Ashgar, a 35-year-old business consultant. They have set up the Muslim Public Affairs Committee UK. MPAC were holding a meeting to recruit new members. Their aim? To try to stop the anger of young Muslims turning into violence. They want Muslims to engage in the democratic process. What happened last July? That was Muslims setting the agenda, wasn't it? But did they represent you? That's shocking, isn't it? Someone set the agenda again for 1.8 Muslim, million Muslims in this country and a billion outside. And we had no say in it. If we don't like what's going on, guess what? We can change it. It's not going to be easy, but life ain't easy. Tough, live with it. Who currently in the UK represent Muslims? Is it Mab, MPAC, Nassim Hamid, Amir Khan, Danny Williams? Who? Who represents us? Is it our mosque leaders? Doesn't matter, whichever one of those examples I've picked, Muslims are not being represented. Ashgar's organisation has made a point of targeting the traditional Muslim leadership for failing to speak up. We say that every single Muslim institution and every single Muslim leader is negligent in tackling terrorism. Why should another 50 people have to die? Why should the Muslims have to suffer a backlash? All because those pathetic Muslim leaders have not lifted a single finger. If MPAC had its way, these mafia goons in our mosque would have an open day once a month and invite every single non-Muslim into the mosque for a meal. Not, not to convert them, but to say, why, what do you fear about Muslims? What don't you understand? Do you think we're all terrorists? Do you th is that what you think, we're, you know, we're all dodgy? Ask me and let me explain it to you. But you're, all, you're also saying if your arguments fail, eventually people will have to take up arms. Not, well, we're not advocating that they do, but the proof is that they have. What, mm. what you know, look at 7-7, you know, look at 911. Ashkar clearly believes that the failure of the traditional Muslim leadership to speak out on behalf of angry young Muslims could lead to some taking violent action. But this would only ever be a minority. The real danger is that as young Muslims separate themselves from Britain, their understanding for such acts will grow. I ended my journey back in Stoke and met up with Azad Yassin, a taxi driver. His life used to be the same as many other taxi drivers in this Midlands town, but today it's completely different, and the speed of that transformation captures just how quickly the Muslim community is changing. Less than six months ago, Azad spent most of his time with non-Muslim friends, who even gave him a new first name, a Christian name. The net name given to me by some of the, the, some of the mates, and the English mates, um, used to be James, because they used to think I'm that I had in their culture, in their way of life. If I'd met you uh, four months ago, what would you be wearing? What would you look Just like? Just normal English clothes, jeans, T-shirt, jacket or something. Hair would be, obviously I've got a hat on now, but hair would have been caught, brown hair, designed, fashioned. Beard? Um, no beard, no moustache, clean shaven. But now that Azad has rediscovered Islam, he sees his old way of life as incompatible with his religion. And you were turning your back on bad times. Yeah, I mean, I tell him, you have no peace. You argue with your wife. 
you don't look at your kids, you don't come in, you stay out till late at night with your friends, you know, you're just not bothered about anything. There's no, no, there's no, there's no inner peace. You can never get that inner peace through alcohol, through good-looking women, through going on holiday to owning a Mercedes Benz. As a taxi driver, Azad is always aware of the British way of life and what he sees merely reinforces his views. Whatever I see in my daily routines, especially at night time, it, it's, it's bad the way women are treated, you know. Women in this country are abused. Men just look at women as a sort of sex object, you know. If he can see all her parts hanging out and flashing out everywhere, he's going to be more tempted to go to that woman and to perform, I don't know, sexual acts upon her. And Islam teaches against all these things. Azad's retreat into his religion is now setting him apart from his passengers. What effects it had on uh, the people who get into your cab? Some people just don't speak at all. I've had one or two, you know, remarks. They might just look at me and think, right, Ben Laden appearance, he's one of them followers, you know what I mean? But, you know, I've not made any new non-Muslim friends. Um, most of my time I spend with my kids and my missies or my mother and father, my, my immediate family. You could become very isolated. Well, I am to some extent, even now, because I don't see anybody. Isolated and increasingly cut off from British life, Assad has gone from integration to separation, a journey that encapsulates the story of our survey. And the further he moves away from his British beginnings, the more he can understand why Muslims would bomb London. What do you think 7-7 was about? Well, the, the lads who did it were young Muslims born and bred in this country. Basically, they, th they thought that their views, what they had in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think that some of them felt so strong about it, that they felt so that strong, that they went and did what they did. They woke up one day, they thought, right, we've had enough of the protesting. I mean, how many millions of thousands gathered at London and protested against Iraq? Where were the politicians? They didn't listen to the people. The people who vote their men, they don't listen to them. So these young lads thought, we've had enough. They aren't listening to us. We've got no armor. We've got no army. There's no other way we're going to do it. This is the way forward. More and more young British Muslims like Azad want to live apart, thereby bringing integration to a halt. Separatism breeds fear, misunderstanding, intolerance. Disagreements eventually flare into conflict. To restart the process of integration, there has to be real dialogue. And the first step is to understand what British Muslims really want. Later this evening, you can follow the debate on Sharia TV. Young Muslims ask scholars and clerics just how they can navigate through 21st century Britain. Sharia TV at midnight on four. A spiritual journey with children who see and hear dead people. Cutting edge, my child's psychic is next on four. To download a podcast debate on young Muslims and to take the survey featured in this programme yourself, log on to channel4.com slash dispatches.